and welcome to day two of the Nixon National Cancer Conference. My name is Jim Byron. I'm the president and CEO of the Richard Nixon Foundation. We're going to get right into things this morning, but I'm going to start by asking all of you right now to take out your phones, open up the calendar app. I'm serious. Take out your phones and open up the calendar app. Pull up your daily planners, if you're still a somebody that writes, like me, you know, has a daily planner. And mark down January 15 and 16 of 2025, because that's going to be the dates of the next Nixon National Cancer Conference. And I look forward to seeing all of you back here in Yorba Linda one year from now. The first panel this morning is addressing a topic of let's call it curious interest and great concern, not only to the medical community and not only to cancer patients, but quite literally to people everywhere, and that is the subject of artificial intelligence. How can AI help the delivery piece of cancer care? Here to kick things off is Dr. Peter Pisters, the president and CEO of MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where he previously served in faculty and leadership positions for more than 20 years. Dr. Pisters is a renowned cancer surgeon, researcher, professor, and hospital administrator. Prior to joining MD Anderson as its president and CEO in 2017, Dr. Pisters led more than 14,000 employees and 1,700 physicians as president and CEO of the University Health Network in Toronto. He is a member of more than two dozen national organizations and serves or has served in leadership positions on the advisory boards of many others, including several for the National Cancer Institute. Uh, before I welcome Dr. Pisters to the stage, I want to simply thank him for this is the third Nixon National Cancer Conference in which he has attended in person and participated. Thank you, Dr. Pisters. And now uh, let's start our first panel. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, great to be with all of you. I suspect that this might be the most interesting topic uh, because um, all of us are reading about this uh, literally every single day and it's impacting society um, in ways that maybe we never imagined a year ago, even though we've all experienced Siri and Alexa uh, for some time and wondered, I wonder where this is going. Um, I'll have a few brief opening comments and then I'll allow the panel to introduce themselves. We have a terrific panel today. I think this is going to be a rich discussion. And towards the end, we'll be able to take questions from you uh, that I think uh, will help enrich the discussion overall. Uh, what I would say in introducing this topic is that we're at a unique moment in time in many ways, and probably everyone in the room has experienced uh, chat GPT or had the realization or what we could describe as the Netscape moment at the same time that you first used a browser and you realized, oh, my life is going to change um, in dramatic ways. Or if we took a step back and we thought about what this means for humanity, and we understood that in the past, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, what happened is that machines replaced physical labor, and now cognitive labor is going to be replaced by computers. And that could completely transform society. In our institution, um, we really see AI as the greatest opportunity and simultaneously as the greatest risk. And there are very few things in business or in medicine that are both a gigantic risk and a gigantic opportunity. So there's really lots to unpack, particularly as it relates to oncology or clinical medicine, or many things that really impact um, the future of uh, healthcare in America and around the world. So um, what I'll do is allow the panel to introduce themselves. And as they uh, do that, if you could briefly uh, outline your organization, um, and tell the group one fast fact um, about yourself that people might not know. I'll start, as you just heard, uh, I'm fortunate to be the president of the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And a fast fact, I'm a cyclist and I do an annual 100-mile ride in Colorado every year. Over to you. Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Doug Flora. I'm a practicing medical oncologist about 20 years into a, uh, a specialty as a breast cancer doctor. Um, I run a six hospital systems cancer program just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I think I'm up here with these esteemed uh, panelists because I founded a journal called AI and Precision Oncology in which I'm the editor in chief. And we're trying to publish the things that we're about to talk about to share in a peer reviewed fashion um, the importance of these updates. I think we're more Siri than Skynet, but we'll see what the panel says. 
What about the fast fact? Oh, fast you fact. Can't skip that. I, I would say um, I'm just nerdy enough that I spent my COVID year studying chess games to just to try and beat my son and my dad. It kept me sane, and I was successful beating my dad, but I will never again beat my son because he learned faster than I did. Hi, thanks, Peter, uh, and good morning, everybody. My, my name is uh, Ed Kim. I'm a medical oncologist and serve as the uh, physician in chief at City of Hope Orange County. Uh, I've been here about three years now as we build a new hospital uh, as part of City of Hope's uh, enterprise in, in Orange County. Um, I. Uh, must be up here because I must be the social media guy. A fast fact about me is that uh, my daughter and I uh, put a TikTok video earlier this year as we attended the first concert for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour, and uh, and we attend. Yes, thank you. <laughs> He's the market. Thank you. And uh, it, it got a million hits on TikTok with uh, 200,000 likes, and uh, she was interviewed by the Today Show and Ryan Seacrest Radio and. I just was the nice supporting father on the side. So that, that must be my role up here, I think, to see how those uh, TikTok AI engines work to uh, magnify your hits. So, uh. Cliff? Yes, thanks very much. My name is Cliff Huddis. I'm a medical oncologist. Uh, I was chief of breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering for almost 20 years. But since 2016, I've served as the CEO of the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And I think one of many possible relevancies to this panel is that about a decade ago, we at ASCO took up the challenge from the Institute of Medicine to build a rapid learning system, in this case for oncology, using the newly emerging data in medical record systems. Uh, we built and nurtured that business called CancerLink for about a decade, and just in December, spun it off into the F4 profit sector. Um, so we've got lots of learnings and insights um, and scars, perhaps, to share from, from that experience, which I think lays part of the groundwork for the AI discussion ahead. Um, I always um, go back to Philadelphia when somebody wants to talk about something uh, that, that might not be obvious about me, but I'll just say this. My very first paying job was selling Liberty Bells in the Betsy Ross house for the <laughs> 1976 U.S. Bicentennial when Frank Rizzo was the mayor. And we can talk about that if you want. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrew Trister. I'm uh, the chief scientific and chief medical officer at a company called Verily, which is the health arm of uh, Google, the alphabet, one of the alphabet companies. I've been in this role for uh, just under six months. Uh, prior to that, I led digital health and AI investing for Bill Gates uh, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm a radiation oncologist by training, but I'm, unlike my esteemed colleagues here, I'm not in practice anymore. And one fast fact is that during the pandemic, I picked up um, being a barista because our coffee shop in Seattle closed. So I had to teach myself using YouTube, and I'm going to be going to, uh, to compete in the barista competition in Seattle this coming summer. So I'm very excited about that. Do you make a good cortada? I do, in fact, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we can test this out a little later, maybe, after the panel. OK, I think you can see how amazingly talented uh, our panel is. Um, Nerds. That, that's right. Uh, so in thinking about this topic, it's probably best discussed if we break it up and segment it, because it is so huge. And uh, some segments that we will talk about include uh, aspects of clinical medicine, aspects of research and discovery, and then uh, how we think the societal dimensions of this can hopefully re really improve the equity in the delivery of healthcare, something I know that's important to the entire panel here. So um, let's start with clinical medicine and aspects of how AI can impact that. And we'll just go uh, through the panel, starting with you, Andrew, at, at the end, just to get inputs from people focused on how clinical medicine could change or will change. Over to you, Andrew. Yeah, so no small topic. I, I think, you know, fundamentally, as you said, Peter, in the beginning, the, the world has changed uh, almost overnight uh, last November. So when ChatGPT became a product that people could go and, and test out, this was not the first chat bot. This was not the first GPT model, right? This is actually the three and a half model, right? GPT 3.5. But somehow there was something innately human about the way that people were able to communicate in ways that we did not see in prior uh, experiences, right? The previous chatbots 
that had been published by Facebook or Microsoft, uh, had, they had these uncanny experiences where people knew that it was a computer, right? So the, the original idea of the Turing test, right? So from mathematician, cryptographer uh, in the 1940s, putting forward the idea that artificial intelligence should fool a human, uh, and that's when it truly becomes intelligent. We seem to be getting to superhuman abilities in these models. But with that, there's a lot of excitement, and indeed, I agree, this is more Siri than Skynet, right? We're not going to start seeing bombs draining, raining down because of artificial intelligence. I think the real question has been more, is this the most natural application for how it is that people access uh, these, these bots, right? So do you want to ask questions of it? Do you want it to help you as a, an assistant, right? Microsoft has come out with these co-pilots uh, for everything. So if, if you want to learn how to code up uh, a new app, you can just use the co-pilot in GitHub, right? And it will write the code for you if you just tell it, this is what I want the app to do. I think the real question when it comes to clinical care has to be, are these going to be co-pilots for doctors or patients? Or are these going to be replacements? And I think a lot of people have been very concerned, appropriately, that we are moving so quickly to superhuman ability that there's going to be a push to, to regulate and stop the replacement part uh, and focus much more on the mundane, you know, very mechanical stuff that happens in clinical care delivery all the time. Right? How do I do billing? How do I do pre-authorizations? If any of you have gone to the doctor, you had to fill out all those forms every single time, right? These are questions that probably can be addressed more readily and not have this high risk. But I do think that there is that, that promise that if, if, we, if these technologies really do work in a way better than the mean doctor, like not the mean, the, the median, let's say, yeah. So, uh, right, the average doctor, then, uh, shouldn't that be the part that gets us to equity, right? If people were able to access those technologies uh, before they went to the doctor and, and start to answer the questions appropriately and maybe even get answers back uh, to know what to do next, those are, those are applications that I think would be really valuable from a society perspective, but we have to be very thoughtful about what it means for the regulators, what it means for people, and how is it that we actually prove that this works as well as going to the doc does now. Great point. So I think one theme that's clearly emerging is the co-pilot model or the replacement model. I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists think about that. Cliff. So, so that's a perfect, uh, I think, start to this discussion that we can expand in a couple of ways. As I've been thinking about this, um, I think that there are at least two broad categories of applications. There is the co-pilot uh, clinical interface model all of the things that look something like um, search on steroids. And that's maybe not even an accurate descriptor of it, but it's the way I think most of our community is going to first start to interact with it because we're used to search, we're used to asking a question, getting an answer. And just in that narrow domain, um, I would point out the following. It's entirely going to be, it is going to be entirely dependent upon the quality um, and curation of the models that feed into it. Um, and I'll just point out a little bit of a pearl that's going to plague us almost from the beginning, which is the authoritative voice of the responses that come back uh, could lull many in our community into thinking they have arrived at the correct answer to a challenge. And that may or may not be right, especially in the next months and early years of this. And I say this with complete enthusiasm for the transformative long-term impact and benefit. I don't think we're hyperbolic in talking about how the world is changing, but I do think these next few years are going to be fraught. There's a second part to this, this though, and we've just started to talk about it, which is maybe the invisible part. Um, I don't really have to know how the regulators and transformers and whatnot serve to make sure that there's 120 volts at you know 50 to 60 megahertz sitting at every outlet everywhere I go in North America, but that system just works, and I plug things in, and that's that. In some ways, all of this could be operating sub rosa, just like that, for years to come, making our superficial, our visible interactions a whole lot smoother, easier, and better. And in some ways, I think that that's the revolution ahead in the short term that we won't see. And we're already starting to see it. In fact, it's already happening in the clinical world, whether you know it or not. Payers are using 
early AI models to adjudicate prior authorization, for example. And they can be right or they can be wrong. You may or may not have any visibility into what decisions they're making, but they're running. And they're making these decisions and then being transmitted to us invisibly. So, I mean, obviously we can talk a long, long time. I'll just close by saying that the emerging challenge for me as a, um, a clinician, let me just say, and for our community, is preserving that sacrosanct part of all of healthcare and medicine, which indeed is the patient and physician relationship. And I'll say that if you just quickly look in our journal, the JCO, I can't remember, it's about four or five months ago, uh, a thoughtful member of our community wrote a piece on her theoretical experience seeing a doctor for an advanced diagnosis of cancer in the future, and the doctor was a bot. I mean, it, it was programmed to detect her discomfort and add 45 seconds of empathy to the encounter, for example. It's worth reading because I don't think any of us actually want to get there. So the challenge I'll close with is how we're going to use these tools to allow us to actually face patients eye to eye, focus more, and deliver more of the human part of care. So it's an interesting perspective whether AI can run in the background uh, like a societal operating system. Um, that is super interesting perspective. Okay, Ed. Yeah, I think there's been some really important uh, points brought up uh, by our first two folks here. And, you know, I'm uh, equally excited and terrified at what AI is going to bring. And, and I'm not even sure if everybody has the same definition of what AI is, right? I think we've derived it from our own definitions of our experiences. Instead of calling it artificial intelligence, I almost like to call it augmented intelligence, right? It's because there needs to be a human interface, even with drones and, and other aspects. Someone's piloting it in the background. When it comes to clinical medicine, we, we are dreaming a lot, just like space travel of going to Mars and in, inhabiting other planets. But, you know, as providers on the front line, whether you're a nurse, a PharmD, APP, MD, you want to see very pragmatic things hit the clinic that are going to free up your time. And I would love to see tools that help you build so that you don't have to sit at the end of the day and go through in the computer and code everything. Maybe we can find an, uh, an AI or a deep learning engine to take care of that task. We would all love to use ChatGPT in our notes because, uh, again, that would think about all the number of hours of time that we would free up to spend more patient time face-to-face uh, -face, as opposed to writing all your notes and doing all the billing at the end of the day. And so, you know, if, if those were the first two wins that hit the clinic, I think you would have a very celebrated medical staff across the country if these were acceptable practices. So I think that's really important is that whatever that step is that we make into the clinic, it, it augments what the provider is doing, it adds practical value to save time, and that will help with workforce engagement, it will uh, help with burnout, uh, and it'll allow people to go back to the ways that they want to practice, which is calling your patient with results later instead of having them call and check their web portal for three or four days and maybe even communicating with your peers across systems to give them updates on what's happening. All of this stuff is really automated right now in a very poor way. And so that, that's where I feel like AI could come in and bring the core values of medicine back to that patient uh, really experience, that human touch. And it will empower our workforce in so many ways. And so that's, that's the way I look at it right now. There'll be a lot of other discussion around it. Um, Ed, great points. I mean, the fundamental transaction in medicine is the doctor and the patient. And there is the possibility that this could be transformed. OK, Doug? Well, I guess I look at it from a, what are the problems we're trying to solve today? We have staffing crises in every single cancer center we have. We have somewhere between 13,000 and 19,000 oncologists on the planet, or in the United States right now, taking care of 18.1 million survivors. The number of cancer patients goes up 6, 7, 8, 9 percent per year as we're graying, and none of these things are about to get better. So I, I think we have to work more efficiently, and if these technologies allow us to scale so that we can have a physician make better decisions more quickly, have more information available, solve the problems that the patients are actually coming to us with their existential dread and their anxiety um, rather than typing on the computer. I'm an enthusiastic optimist as far as that would go. Um, it's not lost on me where we sit. I'm 52 now, and for those of you that, um, 
I posted on LinkedIn when Michelle invited me to this thing. On June 28th, when I was born, the day I was born in 1971, the committee came forward um, to the commission recommending this. And to paraphrase what they said was, for the first time in medical history, we now have the tools and the understanding of physiology to convene, to connect, to make a real difference in this war on cancer. And I would say that that was the beginnings of our understandings of biochemistry and physiology, molecular chemistry, genetics. This is the next phase. So I think it's a natural evolution. We don't have buggy drivers anymore. We don't have people making their living growing hay for the carriages that filled up New York City. This is just like that. And I would say the clinical applications for all of us in, in, um, in our roles as, as leaders and hopefully people who are a little bit ahead of everybody else in terms of our reading is that this stuff is here regardless of whether we like it to be or not. You're not gonna put it back in Pandora's box and it's gonna be up to the people in this room and the leaders in this community to regulate it, to make sure it's ethical, to make sure we've addressed bias and to make sure it's functional and useful for the people who need it most, the patients and the doctors. Um, what I would add to what you've heard already, just to close out this dimension of the conversation, is that uh, if you reflect on the last 30 years, uh, the time since we all finished medical school, computers have been progressively, computers and their data have been progressively integrated um, into healthcare delivery. And that's really been beneficial in many ways, but there have been unintended consequences associated with that. The biggest one being that most physicians uh, today spend more time in front of computers than they do with patients. And that, I believe, personally, is a big driver of burnout. It takes away um, the fundamental joy in the practice of medicine. And it puts um, individuals, certainly in our organization, and I expect in some of yours, in front of computers at night. Um, in the evenings. We can measure this when we see clinicians going online, logging into Epic at 9 o'clock at night, and trying to figure out how they're going to supervise math homework and finish their medical records on time. That's a completely dysfunctional system. In fact, it's so dysfunctional that many organizations created a human resource referred to as the scribe to be the interface between the clinician and the electronic medical record. That's fundamentally an indication that there's not been enough innovation. It's actually a barrier to future innovation by companies uh, like Epic who don't see any need to do this because many organizations are hiring scribes because the EMR is so dysfunctional. If we look at the opportunity that lays ahead of us, you could use currently available technology like um, NLP, natural language processing, to capture the, inter the dialogue between the, the patient and the doctor, the questions and the answers, the discussion of the therapy, the risks, that could all be exported into a large language model and moved into Epic in a uh, compliant note that then requires light touch editing by a clinician. If we could climb that mountain, we could transform clinical medicine uh, from what it is today to what um, it could be in the future. So I'm hopeful that AI can really help us to offset a lot of the challenge that's occurred. Just to illustrate this with one example, not that long ago, if you were going to image the chest, you took two images, front to back, AP and lateral, and a radiologist had five minutes to look at the chest radiograph and say, that's tuberculosis, that's pneumonia, or that's lung cancer. Um, then computers were used to get better quality imaging. Uh, and what happened is that two images turned into 300. And the same radiologist was now given the same five minute block to look at 300 images. There's no human being that can look at 300 images in five minutes. And when you put radiologists on a hamster wheel and you tell them you have to read 50 scans an hour, you can take away the joy and the practice of radiology. And that is what has happened at scale in America uh, with the introduction and implementation of computers in the delivery of healthcare services. This can be completely changed uh, with AI, and hopefully we'll see a lot of companies really moving in that direction um, in the future. Um, let's talk now about research, uh, which has tremendous uh, opportunities. If we look at drug discovery or clinical trial design, there are so many aspects of research that could be completely transformed. Uh, Doug, Doug, do you want to start? And then we'll go down this way. Sure. I, I've spent most of my career frustrated by the pace of clinical research, um, the difficulty in enrolling a perfectly stable, good patient into a trial because of 
dense eligibility criteria, barriers to care from a transportation standpoint. And, um, and the ability to do this at scale takes an hour per CRC to review a chart and screen them for trials. And I know you guys all deal with the same things. Wouldn't it be great if the clinician shows up and the program, the machine learning module, the deep learning module has said, these four patients have been screened, they're eligible for these trials. They meet all eligibility criteria. We've already sent the uh, purview letter to the physician so they're aware of the trial. Are you ready to go in and discuss it? And, and those tools existed a year ago, two years ago. There's six or seven companies that are doing it very, very well, scraping this data from a, from a medical record that's full of PDFs and things scanned to the media tab. These machine learning modules can now read this unstructured data, structure it for us just like you've alluded to, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the scribing, um, and deliver that as a product to the clinicians or to the researchers who need that in a matter of seconds, uh, or even do it for the patients who choose to do their own stuff. And we've been talking at the Association of Community Cancer Centers about a uh, uh, countrywide clinical trial repository where patients can enter their own information. So we've already got them queued up for a database so that if there's a trial that's open, say, in one of your centers, I can immediately identify them with the machine learning module and say, hey, you need to go see Dr. Kim's team. Um, you need to go see um, Cliff up in, uh, at Sloan Kettering on Friday afternoons while he's volunteering legally. Um, and, and I love the time savings there because we don't have enough CRCs or researchers. Great. Point. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, you know, when I think about clinical research, there's a lot of things you could think of all the way from how we identify drugs to how they get to the clinic to the patients uh, enrolling. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the patient side. I think you see where I lean there. And, you know, I, I shared about some excitement that we could have happened on the provider side in my last one. I'm gonna share a little terrified on the, uh, on the research side now. Um, we, we have to understand that when we have these databases and what we've set up, it's really important to set them up correctly because that's the information that these learning systems are gonna be pulling from. And if you have flawed databases or flawed concepts, just as we talked about being superhuman, they will be super exacerbated. And, and that's what we have to avoid. Uh, it's no secret that I've been uh, fighting with our folks at Friends of Cancer Research and at ASCO about eligibility criteria and how we write a median of 37 eligibility criteria in clinical trials and oncology. That's a lot of checklists, and there's usually sub-bullets underneath those 37, so it's more than that. And these criteria are sometimes inherently discriminatory sort of, toward un sort of these different populations. Uh, African Americans, whether you talk about the Duffy code antigen that leads to a lower ANC or how we calculate uh, GFR and kidneys, these are inherent flaws that we have perpetuated and have incorporated into these protocols. And so if we don't start with root cause, which is fix the protocol eligibility, then I don't see how AI is going to help us with enrollment because we're gonna take those flawed concepts and now perpetuate them even more. And then if we take those flaws, we're gonna get flawed populations and flawed results. So that's why I'm terrified about that aspect of it. Until we fix where our baselines are, when we truly can say our scientific eligibility criteria reflect the population that exists, not just specific populations, and we can do demographic uh, tests on, on these trials and see that 75% are white and very low percentages are of all the ethnic minorities, it, it's not correct. So I look forward to the day when we can build automated machines to, to help us with this, but getting ahead of it right now would just lead to even a worse disparity among who we're enrolling into these clinical trials. Cliff? So, so here again, I, I would like to maybe broaden the lens on this discussion a little bit because we're talking a lot about the clinical interface and I, there's not much to add. You know, the fundamental problem there is only three to four, maybe five percent of adults enroll in clinical research studies in America and at a minimum uh, for additional reasons, that's a bottleneck in progress. And we can talk about the use of clinical data sets, um, those that we derive out of the electronic records to accelerate that. Um, but I would also just add that there is some great promise not yet realized that we should be thinking about on the preclinical side, where I do think 
these uh, tools may be helpful. And, and specifically what I mean is drug discovery and drug development. Um, here, uh, one could start to at least think about the use of some of these well-trained models uh, for narrowing the range of molecules that we might want to explore in a given circumstance, or identifying the properties of a molecule that would inhibit, you know, last night uh, Doug highlighted the progress in RAS and the decades that it took to, to develop those inhibitors. One could at least dream that having these tools would allow us to shorten that preclinical development time, and that would save uh, obviously huge amounts of uh, effort and money and maybe make the entire system more efficient. I will say at the same time, um, and this gets back to the core issue, one can't fight the laws of gravity. And, and what I mean by that simple statement is, in the end, we need conventional convincing evidence that interventions have utility. We can't model it and then say we know the answer always. We need ways to do that more efficiently. And I think that's what uh, you know, you know, both Doug and Kim have already, to some degree, alluded to. I, I will say, in closing on this issue, I'm actually hugely optimistic on the research side that the equity issue will get addressed in, in ways that are uh, accelerating our, our elimination of the, of the gap. And, and here, I think it's important to reference ourselves or tie ourselves to the current state of affairs. We have huge inequities in access to clinical trials and the products that they produce. And it seems to me that the low cost of distributing these tools into clinics should serve to reduce those barriers. We're still going to be left with expensive drugs and treatments, actually, but at least more people will know what they should be getting. Thanks, Cliff. I hope we have time to come back to the equity issue because it's such an important topic related to this. Uh, Andrew? Yeah, so there, there are a few threads to pull here. And I think, uh, Cliff, you were just alluding to this, like, not just the research, but the products of the research. And I think that if you start at the goal, the goal is to have more equitable access, right? More drugs, more precision, which we'll talk about in the next panel after this. But the idea that more um, allows for people to, to have cure, ultimately, in oncology. And the, the model of going from drug discovery, right? If we start with all of chemistry space, right? That's uh, estimated to be 10 to the 60. It's a number larger than the total number of atoms in the universe. It's impossible to use novel or existing tools to search chemical space for things that could be drugs. But even if we reduce that space significantly, and we can now with AI, which is fantastic, it doesn't mean that those, uh, we don't have that, that proof point yet to shorten the length of time from that discovery to when this thing actually is proven to work and is on market, right? Many of the uh, really exciting <coughs> AI drug discovery companies right now still have not demonstrated the ability to move faster. It still takes about 10 years to go from that discovery, even if it's in a computer uh, and not like in a pipette, all the way to making a drug because we have to ensure safety, we have to ensure efficacy, and we have to run these trials. So coming back to recruiting people and ensuring that we can have more representative data, I think one of the, the advantages that we have seen coming forward in, this, uh, in, in, in the representative data in the data set has been taking not just what we already do in a clinical study or in the, in the uh, care delivery, right? So what's in the EHR is primarily what we think about here or on surveys that a clinical research associate might fill out. And we've, we've started to really think about how can you democratize access to those exact tools and maybe even augment them further, right? So the idea of taking data from the real world, which again is from clinical care, but maybe goes all the way to the home, Right, how can we use devices to augment what we understand a person's experience to be? Right, FDA has now allowed for clinical studies to include patient reported outcomes, which is great. This is a survey that you answer. Right? NIH has funded a whole suite of these things and, and normalized them so that we understand when a person answers a question in this way, this is what this means. Fantastic for looking for adverse events and for understanding what the patient experience is like through taking this medicine. But can we augment that even further, right? Going beyond just what the person reports and actually what is it that we might be able to generate? What does a patient themselves generate if we started to augment their experience with wearables, right? If they had, say, a smartwatch or if they had a sensor in the home or things like that. Those kinds of data are 
way too, too continuous. There are too many variables. It's very, very difficult to understand what a stream of 100 hertz accelerometry on the wrist means for an individual, right? We can derive things like how many steps did you take, what's your heart rate, are you moving around, things like that. But how that then ties back to all these other things that we care about. How are you feeling? Are you having an adverse event? Is this drug actually working? We have to do all of the math to, to connect those dots. But I think that that's the, the next frontier where AI is going to play a huge role because we, we have this preponderance of huge data sources. And it's, again, for an individual to stare at that and make a sense of what the trends look like in a way that is meaningful and that we can make claims to help a, a medicine or, or, or to uh, beget a medicine from a molecule, I think that, that that's the part now where we're going to see this revolution occurring. But again, it's a regulatory question. I think there's a lot of, of evidence that we have to, to think about with respect to tying those all together. Terrific points um, that you've heard. A couple of things I would add, just on the preclinical side, as Cliff was saying, that uh, historically we've really relied on medicinal chemists uh, to look at molecule design and to figure out whether a hydroxyl group or a methyl group needs to be moved to a different part of the molecule. And then to go back into the lab and spend months trying to make that happen before we can put a new compound into a series of tests to determine if it's safe. That process uh, of the preclinical pathway can be accelerated um, over time, and hopefully we'll see that. On the back end, when things get into the clinic, uh, certainly one opportunity is to use real-world evidence in synthetic cohorts where you could think about a synthetic cohort as an AI-derived cohort. And you can see uh, over time the ability for us to move to single-arm designs, which are much easier to accrue to and substantially less expensive. And if you have a single-arm uh, trial and everybody's excited to get that uh, new drug or new combination of drugs, and then you have the ability to create a synthetic cohort that is actually better matched than you can get through traditional randomization because they're matched by all the other medicines they take, they're matched by mutational status, they're matched by age and gender. You can actually get better matching uh, with a synthetic model than you can with traditional randomization. So there are huge opportunities but they are predicated on the reality that the data going in are good. And that's the second problem I want to dig into now, because the, as we look at the challenges of this, a bad data fed into a model doesn't really yield insights. Uh, and that is a, a real challenge that we have, because much of the data, even the data that rests within Epic, is wrong. Um, in fundamental things, uh, such as the stage of the cancer, uh, for example. And so we have to really think about how do we get a front mile strategy for data so that the data that we're using uh, for the AI engine is high quality data, and how do we avoid bias that's introduced uh, uh, through these algorithms. So let's talk uh, for a few moments about the quality of the data and the chicken and egg problem that we have right now and the possibility of bias. We could probably start best with you, Andrew, from the industry side. Sure, yeah. Because we've got these algorithms running in clinical environments for sepsis uh, or hyperglycemia, and uh, they're not perfect. No, and I think you know, th there's, been a, there's been an idea of having uh, basically like an FDA label on these algorithms so that we can understand what data went into building the algorithm and we can then start to apply. But you know, one of the things, just as an anecdote, when, when I was on faculty in radiation oncology, radiation oncology is one of the, the la I think the very last, in fact, uh, specialty, certainly in oncology, of the three that, that are represented here, that uh, still require an oral exam. And I thought that this was a very funny experience, right, to, to go to Louisville for a couple of days and get grilled by you know, the, the really luminary, uh, prominent radiation oncologist, and you're given usually a radiograph, not a CT scan, and you're like, what is it that you should do for this patient? And you have to regurgitate. Well, in this you know, large uh, clinical study, this is the way that the patients were treated. But never once are you asked, would this patient have been expected to be enrolled? So when we think about those 37 enrollment criteria, which is the matching piece of all of this, right, is 
do what we understand from the clinical studies, does it represent something that is right for this particular patient? Now, we don't have the totality of, you know, we're not omniscient, so we don't actually know. No one has a crystal ball, and we're doing our best, right? So you try to use statistics to, to answer this question. But this ended up becoming uh, my calling card on faculty because I would ask a lot of my colleagues when we would review our cases with one another, well, you're, you're choosing to use that particular clinical study, but this patient clearly would never have been able to enroll. But the answer to that is, yeah, but what else do we do? Right? And, we, and we, we want to use evidence. We believe that evidence base is really critical in the way that we approach things. And yet, we recognize that when you're sitting and the human in front of you may not have been eligible for the study, you're going to do your very best based on all of your experience and the evidence that exists today. And this is where I think that this matching problem really comes down to it. And we already heard very specific question, you know, points of, like, we already know in the literature that African Americans have different EGFR um, as, as an example. So that's represented in the data incorrectly because we just haven't gone to measure it, right? We've, we've simply estimated it incorrectly. Those types of errors get propagated throughout. There's another error, though, which is uh, very hard to, to orient ourselves to, and that is the bias of the physicians themselves, right? So uh, an example of this was that there were large data sets that were captured from uh, emergency department visits in Boston and made available for an AI uh, competition. This was 30 years ago, so this is before any of these modern technologies today. And the AI was meant to predict of the people coming in with respiratory distress to the emergency department, how many of them died 30 days later. This is very typical also of sepsis, right? So who is going to die of sepsis in the ICU? And it turns out that the AI, when you, when you approached it from a clinical standpoint, did a pretty reasonable job. It would answer questions like, those people who are younger than 65 and those people older than 65 had different rates of death. The people who were older tended to die at 30 days more often than the people who were younger. Great, that's sort of what you already know, like seeing what happens in the ED. Interestingly, it, it, there were things that were inverted. So it said people with asthma were much less likely to die than people without asthma. And this is very surprising because you kn knew as a clinician that people with asthma tended, when they come in with respiratory distress to the emergency department, tend to have really bad uh, problems with breathing and had to have more intervention. And the issue here was that the data source was only the ED visit and then the death certificate, basically. There was nothing about what happened in between. And when you go back and look at what went on, every single person that had asthma in their chart was immediately admitted to the ICU. So they had a level of care that was way beyond the you know, person just walking in saying, oh, I, I'm not breathing well, and some of those people might be sent home. And they may have been sent home incorrectly because they didn't have the history of asthma. So this is just another example of incomplete data can absolutely bias the way that we understand what happens because we are not capturing every single thing that we do, and nor would I argue that we should do that. But and, and then coming, and, and we'll come back to equity, but I do think that one of the things that has been one of the most difficult elements within uh, our society, and you know, certainly we've seen a lot of, uh, in the last four years, like since the global pandemic with SARS-CoV-2, a lot of things that were small fissures that we understood in the health system became massive chasms for access, for care quality, for payments. So people who are underrepresented in all of these clinical studies are also underrepresented in clinical care, right? Where they access care is not going to be, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to go shop around at four different doctors and try to decide which one is the best fit for me, right? Very often there's a single point of, of contact with the health system if there's even one, uh, and, and sometimes that's paying out of pocket because, in, you know, under insurance or no insurance is still a problem in this country. There, there are really, really big societal issues that the data demonstrate that when faced with how is it that we're going to build in equity, we have to also you know, recognize that in the 5% of people that do participate in clinical studies in the US, there's also bi massive bias with respect to socioeconomic uh, status, rural versus urban um, locales, you know, zip codes of, of different kinds of uh, backgrounds that, that indeed change the way that we understand how it is that we can care for people longer term. So if, if the goal is to have more and better care, right, better medicines and better care, we, we have to begin with how is it that we can 
address these kinds of uh, chasms that have existed. And, and the data allow us to at least examine the problem. Uh, it doesn't obviously give us a solution to it, but, but maybe it does. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Cliff? In terms of the data sets and its, their utility, I think that was really where this question began that, for us. That's and right. We've just heard, I think, an eloquent discussion of some of the challenges. I'll just point out before going on that the root cause here is something that predates this era, which is simply the fundamental problem of retrospective analysis, which has more often misled than led us correctly. And bias in our hypothesis leads to the bias result. But I want to look forward a little bit because, you know, we're, we're talking about what lies ahead vis-a-vis -vis AI. We've spoken a little bit about the use of currently available clinical data sets to generate um, synthetic control arms and so forth. And again, I think especially with the kinds of upgrades that, uh, that, that Ed was describing, that, that maybe um, we will get improved records. But I also would urge that everybody look, at least in 24, at a certain reality with regard to the medical records in the U.S. Number one, and most of you may know this, but it's worth saying out loud, the record systems that we're using are not meant to help us deliver high-quality care, transmit information, or accomplish anything that's patient-centric. Fundamentally, they are meant to justify levels of billing. And they're engineered for that purpose. Number two, um, in the Recovery Act from 2008, which was the, I think, 15 to $17 billion federal investment that accelerated conversion to electronic medical records, interoperability was, to a large degree, assumed or superficially uh, encoded. But the reality is we have failed to achieve meaningful interoperability. And now I'll get to our hard-earned experience with CancerLink. Naively, in 2009 and 10, we set out to build a system to extract this data, which was collected for other purposes, but to start to deliver trial matching, synthetic control arms, quality tools and measures, and improvement. And I'll just give you a, a, one of my favorite anecdotes. In the first two years when we had onboarded just in the low six figures in patients, I can't remember if we had two, 300,000 records, we had eight medical record systems. At that time, simply describing white blood cell count. And this is a number, and it's a standard result that's in every chart, and it's in a database. There were 60 different ways that that one variable was recorded in eight medical record systems deployed at about, I don't know, 15 or 18 centers at that time. Each upgrade of the medical record system risks putting in code that breaks the conversions that we wrote. By the time we sold CancerLink, we had written more than a million lines of code dedicated solely to converting and standardizing those data so that you could then turn around and start to use it in the ways that we're dreaming of. I don't say this, again, to be negative. I am optimistic that we're going to accelerate our progress and get someplace good. But nobody should be deluded into thinking that all you have to do is hoover up a whole bunch of medical records, assemble them, and you're going to have magic. The flaws that are in there, the mistakes that are promulgated, left side, right side, extra diagnoses, social history that's not right, all manner of things, not just get inserted, but don't get caught and get carried forward in the quest for higher billing. And so I, I, we've learned bitterly. By the time we were done, we had about 7 million records. That's what we transmitted. And I will say in closing, the real value of this isn't the 7 million historic records. It's the network and what we're going to do uh, going forward because of these challenges. I, I, I'll just say one last thing because I'm passionate about this. We missed an opportunity two decades ago. In the United States, you drive on the right, you stop at a red light, and you go at green. We have a set of rules. It doesn't matter what state you're in. It doesn't matter what city or town. And it is just a tragedy that we didn't mandate a standard database for the medical record system. All different front ends could run. And I'll just say I'm not crazy because your email systems work this way. It doesn't matter if you're in a Mac or an IBM, if you're on a phone or whatever. It doesn't matter. They interface and work and transmit. And we failed at this. Well, this is an interesting topic because it gets to some of the fundamental dynamic tension here. Should you use market forces or regulation? 
um, to advance AI. It's the same issue that you described it's 20 years ago. It's a multi-billion dollar mess. Um, we used market forces and it, it didn't work out so great. That's the reality. Ed. So Cliff and I think very similarly. He took a lot of my thunder on that one, but, uh, but, I, but I agree. No, it's good, it's good. You know, I was gonna start, you know, with more an excited side of this, uh, but I was gonna start with, you know, for anyone in this room who has a medical record or, you know, is a patient or has that, you know, how many of you have found errors in your own medical records? And that's the data that Cliff, that Dr. Huddis is talking about that's going to be used to now determine things down the road. So there is a challenge there. But, you know, I mean, I, I, should, I would be remiss if we weren't acknowledging the fact that we're sitting in the Nixon Library here in California. And California drivers, by the way, do not obey red lights and stop signs, <laughs> I'll tell you that. I've been in both coasts, I've been in Texas, so it's pretty bad out here, so just work. We, we don't obey, don't walk. Yes, right, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think we have to look at this as a, as a call to action. And I think uh, Cliff has talked about this, that we didn't. We missed the opportunity to standardize these data sets and get structured data when EHRs were coming in. Okay, we missed it. But, you know, Richard Nixon talked about fighting cancer, you know, 50 years ago. And, there, you know, there wasn't a lot in cancer at that point. I mean, we had, you know, people, brilliant scientists working on this. I think just like we've demonstrated across different academic institutions and other institutions where we can do something like the Cancer Genome Atlas. This is now the next step to how we can bring in AI and come together as a holistic community and, and start a structured data sort of pro project. And it's gonna take funding at various levels to get this, but I think all of us recognize the importance of getting it right. And, and the TCGA has been so valuable in so many ways. It's, sure, there are shortcomings, but you can't solve everything when you start a plan. It evolves over time. I think this is the opportunity now as we have more streamlined EHRs, only a few of them out there now. We certainly want to integrate this type of technology because we know it will benefit folks. I mean, everyone's building their own thing. City of Hope, we have a sepsis aspect, and we're looking at molecular biomarkers. And those data are pretty structured, and they're pretty objective that you can pull from. But to take the next level and really find that unstructured data or more of that human intelligence data where we're thinking about things, we have to have these structured data sets. And, and that's where I would almost make this a call to action. You know, let's, let's get together. Let's figure out how, what we need to do, who we need to lobby, yes, we, we, and, and, and support the actions that can occur. And, and I think that will really help propel us over the next decade so that 10 years from now, when we're sitting in the Nixon Library and talking about this, we'll be reflecting on some of the successes that we've been doing. I just can't help but jump in. I just want to just mouth to you. The current NIH director, Monica Bertignoli, when she was at ASCO, started a project to address this M-code, the Minimum Common Oncology Data Elements. And it's expanding through the years. It's supported uh, through a partnership with MITRE. And the idea is that more and more of the medical records components will be recorded in a standardized fashion, independent of medical record system or site. So my plug is to look into M-code and think about implementation if you have any control at all. Okay, you got the final word here, Dan. You can't, you can't cover AI in 45 minutes for one. Um, I think some of the things that you brought up, um, I would encourage the audience to, to play in the sandbox. These guys are maybe six months ahead. When these transformers came out in 2017, this was all brand new. The best architects in the world have had access to these tools for five, six years. And so I, I would look back at when we started blogging or when you had Netscape you'd mentioned the first time you had an internet browser. <clears throat> I can remember the day one of my senior fellows taught me about Google or my first Yahoo account when I was a third year med student on pediatrics. We're at that moment in our lives. Get on there and play. You know, chatbot GPT-4 costs 20 bucks a month. It will save you hours a day if you spend a few hours now to learn how to do it. I would estimate I probably save three and a half to four hours a day in emails, letters for uh, medical denials. Um, I'm crafting programs for all of my leaders where I'll give them a press release that I've written about the product that I want them to come up with at the end of the year so they know exactly what my expectations are to work backwards. And those are, those are built in minutes. And so what used to take me an hour takes seconds now. 
Uh, and, and so I would encourage you, as a last word, we're, plenty of us will be meandering around in, in, uh, in the post settings, and we can all connect on LinkedIn or wherever, but um, it, it's inherent upon the leaders in this room to start to get facile so you can guide your teams, you can get data governance going, you can start to make sure you're understanding regulations and risk uh, as you guide your own institutions, but you will not be able to compete in 2024, 2025, or beyond without it. Just a few comments, then we can open it up uh, to questions. As an institutional leader, when we look at the electronic medical record, as you heard from Cliff, we started 20 years ago with seven or eight companies over time. But over time, um, due to market pressures uh, and due to innovation, we're down to what could be described as a duopoly or maybe even a monopoly. And generally speaking, monopolies are not good. Um, and we're seeing elements of that right now as we interface with Epic, which is the dominant uh, system right now. Uh, part of the duopoly is also Cerner, which was acquired by Oracle, and maybe that will open up new avenues uh, for that company. When you look at uh, the EMR, and, and Cliff made this point really well, it was really engineered uh, for back office function for revenue cycle. And the sale was made to health systems uh, to the CFO, uh, not to the chief medical officer. And the value proposition was this will improve your AR. Uh, because once the epic encounter is closed, the bill goes out the door, and, and it's correct. And that's how they gained market dominance over time. Sadly, it wasn't engineered for the fundamental transaction in clinical medicine, the intersection between the patient and the doctor. That was programmed around the margins. Um, after the product was released, and it is imperfect. And we hear that all the time. And that's illustrated by, by the rise of scribes, um, the reality that you need a human. Imagine if we all needed humans to work our iPhones, um, an interface between us and our phone, because the product was so dysfunctional. Um, that's, that's really what we have uh, right now uh, with, with the main system that's used uh, across America. So that company um, needs a stimulus to innovate, and if you take away the competition, they do not have the same uh, stimulus to innovate. Now that said, um, they've done a great job integrating with the medical community. The users group that's been established is really fantastic, and hopefully we'll see AI integrated in very important ways in the future, uh, exemplified, I think, by their reach out to Microsoft um, and Microsoft's partnership with Epic uh, on the inbox, which uh, could really transform management of the inbox, which is uh, the in-basket significant issue for clinicians in America today. So Michelle, should we take some questions from the audience now? Sorry, I heard a lot of excitement, a lot of opportunity, and a lot of frustration. And we have a bifurcated medical system now. Um, what I don't understand is where the leadership is going to come. So we have a system that can work. Is this going to come from the government? Is this going to come from CMS? Is it going to come from Medicare? Is it going to come from the NIH? Because there is no funding at all available now within the current system that we're working with with NIH to do a major project or to, or to do another moonshot or to do, so who takes the leadership? Who's in charge? How do we get a system that begins to be coherent or we're just gonna have one-offs and just see if one of these one-offs is better? Great question, Ellen. Um, Cliff, probably you're the best position to answer this. As always, that's, that's, that's actually a universal American healthcare delivery question if you think about it. It's just this is the latest version of it. I don't have an easy answer because I think um, pragmatically it's going to be a competition because we don't have a unified uh, set of uh, expectations or leadership on this. I think there's possibility that demonstration or larger projects, for example, even in ARPA age might, might serve to, to deliver some of this. I also think, though, it takes a tremendous amount of political will because we would have to agree to some compromises. Uh, some people won't get what they want. What they want, sorry. So it's an age-old challenge, and maybe maybe it should be you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> 
another question over here. So much of the discussion turned around things like language processing, uh, deep neural networks, uh, utilizing databases to educate an artificial intelligence system to then give us some assistance. To my mind, the biggest risk is with generative AI. And I'd like the panel to uh, discuss that a little bit. Andrew? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think if, if I'm to, um, to read into your question, I think uh, one of the things that we've seen on the generative models has been this idea of hallucination. It's kind of like not a great word for what is actually going on, but the, the construct, again, as, as has been alluded to, this idea of uh, answers coming back with a certain level of authority in a language that people believe, right? So when we have used uh, human interface, right, for decades now has been, I have a question, I go into a search box and I get an answer, and you can decide the veracity of that. Now that you're getting full paragraphs, it may very well be that that entire paragraph was just made up, that there are no facts in, in included in that, and yet it seems very factual. That is a very big concern if we were to, uh, to see that be used extensively within medical practice. And I think that uh, actually before this panel, we were having exactly this conversation. What would it take for us to have uh, a body to either provide an imprimatur or, or you know, the like good housekeeping seal of approval equivalent on what the outputs would be and whether there are boundary conditions that we can all agree to. Like maybe this shouldn't necessarily recommend a chemotherapy, right? Because that could kill someone uh, versus like take an aspirin and call me in the morning, like, you know, Marcus Welby. Maybe a Marcus Welby chatbot is not so bad if it's going to be limited to here are the six things that you could do, right? So, so it's going to be a question I think of, of that that type of uh, approach, uh, but we, we're not there yet. I was, we're pursuing this very actively right now at ASCO because, frankly, our community isn't so technologically quick. We feel like we have an opportunity and obligation to educate and bring our folks up. I'm just going to share, this is my own personal recent insight, which I didn't understand before. Maybe you all know this already, but it provides some grounding. An answer from search, as you just heard, gives you a bunch of you know, blue-lined results, and you can click through them and check on it, and they, they are, to a degree, very authoritative. They may not be relevant to your question exactly, but they are, to a degree, right. The problem with chat that we have to keep in mind is the generative answers aren't facts. They are probabilistic assemblies of words. And I, I've shared this story somewhat publicly, but I'll just say, um, when I asked ChatGPT um, who my wife was, it created in its first answer what you would call hallucination. Gave her a career and position that was not true. And when pressed in the chat cycle, still identified her and where she works and what she does. But the part where she went to medical school was made up. And it's not that it's lying. It's that it was a pro probabilistic answer. I have a screenshot of it saved forever because it's crazy. And the dilemma is that it looks authoritative, and if you didn't know better, you would think Cliff's wife is a doctor. You'd have no reason to doubt that. We need to uh, wrap it up. I want to thank the panel for a terrific discussion, and, and I hope we can do a TikTok video. Uh, <laughs>